G'day ladies and gents, Cubic Mini here. In a previous video, I introduced the Orbital Strike TNT Cannon. A cannon capable of sending a payload to any block corner of a Minecraft world. Check out my previous video if you want to see the cannon in action. But in this video, I want to get into the science and mathematics behind this piece of technology because it is really cool and interesting. I spent months researching the theory behind this cannon and then took only two weeks to execute this knowledge to make a fully functioning cannon. So how does this cannon work? How are we able to deliver a deadly payload anywhere in a Minecraft world using only redstone mechanics and clever mathematics? Well, it all starts with a concept known as a lazy acceleration, where we can place a payload into stasis so it doesn't move but can still receive knockback from explosions. This allows us to charge the momentum of the payload over time to launch it a very long distance. The first question is, why would we want to do this in the first place? Normally, a TNT cannon will try to impart all the momentum into the payload in a single shot. This works pretty well for small cannons at short ranges. However, as you scale up the cannon to hit longer distances, you run into an issue where you need an excessive amount of TNT delivered to the payload in a limited amount of time, resulting in massively impressive machines such as this cannon by Emery and Intricate from the TNT archives. The only caveat is that these cannons have enormous TNT compressors which are compacted and optimized to the point that building them feels like you're trying to build the Death Star from scratch. However, if we remove the limitation of needing to get all of our momentum into the payload in a single shot, what we get is a cannon that makes use of much smaller TNT compressors to achieve similar results. However, I should note that this cannon also has its own drawbacks in that you can't actually have the player anywhere near the cannon when it's firing. On the other hand, a cannon like this can use the player itself as a projectile, which can actually be pretty handy at times. However, if we are only interested in weaponizing the payload, then Lazy Acceleration becomes a pretty good option. Alright, let's get into the theory of Lazy Acceleration. In Minecraft, the world is of course divided into chunks. For stuff to happen, the game will load chunks in an area around the player. And the game has various rules for what chunks can be loaded at any given time, and what can happen in those chunks based on how they're loaded. For example, an entity that comes through a nether portal will actually create a chunk loading ticket which will load a region of 3x3 chunks around the portal which is indicated by this green glass. Using the game rule spectators generate chunks false, we can effectively simulate this area as if I wasn't here. So now if I move away and go back to the area you can see now only the chunks being loaded by the nether portals are currently visible. However, these green chunks are only the entity processing chunks. What you will find is that whenever you have these entity processing chunks, they will have a border around them known as lazy chunks. Inside of these lazy chunks, what we will see is that entities stop being processed, however, redstone can still be processed. And what is interesting about lazy chunks is that even though entities don't get processed, they can still be interacted with by redstone components. So you can see this minecart is frozen. However, if we have a minecart inside of lazy chunks being pushed by a piston, the piston can actually move the minecart. And this applies to any entity, including TNT. So right now, this TNT is in stasis. However, my client bugs out a little because it's trying to project what the TNT will do as an entity. So even though you saw that TNT being animated and looking like it was exploding, if I jump back out as spectator, the entity is invisible but you can see it was still there. And this is an unfortunate issue when dealing with lazy chunks, as the game was never meant to have the player in areas where entities weren't being processed. And so the rendering for things inside of lazy chunks is kind of broken. 
And what is especially interesting is that entities inside of entity processing chunks can also interact with entities that are in lazy chunks. So right now, both of the TNT entities are being processed and so the TNT that explodes first is preparing the second TNT. However, if I couple in this command block that will immediately put me in spectator, like so, you can see the second TNT remains in stasis and the instant that I appear, the TNT starts moving. And the best part is that this motion that's applied to the entity that's in stasis is cumulative. So if I couple this in again and fire this system, we get multiple charges and the instant that it gets loaded, all of the momentum is released at once. So this is the principle of lazy acceleration. And in the orbital strike cannon, we use the intersection of two entity processing chunks and two lazy processing chunks to give us full directional control over our payload. If we focus on the intersection during firing, we can see how we use the lazy chunks to store the payload and keep it in stasis. This payload is a stab charge, meaning it has a secondary propellant charge that drives the payload into the ground. This allows the payload to stab a hole in the ground. How the stab charge works in itself is really interesting and we'll look into it later. But for now, all that is important is that the payload is suspended in lazy chunks and can be moved and manipulated by pistons and blocks. Once the payload is ready, we align it to the center of the intersection where it receives acceleration from our motion axes. Propellant TNT is aligned to the center of the stair channel where its exact position can be toggled from lazy to entity processing with a very fine movement. Thus, we can precisely control when the propellant explodes with a gentle nudge. The precise quantity of propellant controls the exact position our payload will move to. Once the firing sequence is complete, the gates drop allowing the payload to pass through and the center of the cannon is loaded. The payload has so much momentum that it seems to disappear instantly. To understand what happens to our payload once it flies over to the target coordinates, we need to do a bit of entity physics. Here I just have a command block that is giving a TNT entity exactly 10 blocks per tick velocity in each cardinal direction. So if I go ahead and tick freeze, activate the command block, then tick forward a single step, our TNT moves exactly 10 blocks in each cardinal direction. And if we place blocks in the way, the TNT will collide with them and then cancel the momentum in that direction. But here's when things start to get pretty weird. If I put another block to collide right here, and then spawn our TNT, now it's slamming into this block. If we move it back, it's still colliding with this block right here. If I add another block like so, look what happens. The TNT is stopping in here. If I move this over like so, move this over. Now when I spawn the TNT, it's stopping over here. This is a very nuanced phenomenon that you will experience with entities moving at very high speeds. So we know that this TNT is moving at 10 blocks per tick in each direction. And so it moves 10 blocks in each direction in a single tick. And the way that entity motion is actually processed in the game is that first it will move in the Y direction. Then it will pick either the X or Z direction depending on which velocity is greater. If they are both the same, it will then move in the X direction. And then finally it will move in the remaining direction and that is the motion that the entity actually takes each tick. At very low velocities this sort of jarring motion is not even noticeable and the entity appears to move continuously in a direct line to its destination. But if the entity is moving very fast it will transition to this jarring motion where it will collide with blocks on the path that it actually takes when it's processed each tick. This, by the way, is what enables our payload to actually escape the cannon. Because you can imagine, 
If our payload was moving in a diagonal motion, like so, it would have to contend with these stairs on the side channels. However, because we're giving our payload so much velocity, it will move in one of the cardinal directions first, and then it will be completely clear of the cannon. You might also notice this powdered snow in the middle of the cannon. Entities that pass through things like powdered snow have a very interesting behaviour. So we already have established that entities will move like ghosts in the cardinal axes each tick and will process collisions on those paths. However, when it comes to movement impeding blocks like powdered snow, the entity will have a check which isn't executed until the end of its motion. So the entity must move into the powdered snow to then know that it is in the powdered snow in the first place. When the entity's motion is next processed and the check is enabled, it will move with 95% of its velocity and then set the velocity to zero at the end of the motion. This results in the entity stopping dead in its tracks. By the way, this was a trick taught to me by the one and only K-Man, the OG of Cannon Tech. Here is a very simple cannon that shoots a piece of TNT a pretty long distance. If we go ahead and tick freeze, activate it, and then tick forward a single step, we can see where our TNT lands in the first tick. If we now put our TNT inside of powdered snow, then tick forward again, and unfreeze, you can see the TNT never actually realized it was in the powdered snow because we created the powder snow after the TNT moved. However, if we go ahead and activate this cannon again, would you look at that? The payload stops moving the instant after it has passed through the powder snow. So in order to use this in our cannon, we can't just simply create the payload inside of the powdered snow or create the powdered snow inside of the payload. We have to create the payload somewhere else and then make sure the payload is moved into the powdered snow so that it knows it's there. This is why during the payload alignment process we have this flying machine actively pushing the payload into position so that it executes this movement process that enables the check for powdered snow. This ensures that the moment we load the payload and it snaps to the target location, it stops completely above the target. Things start to get a little bit tricky when you consider a falling block entity such as an anvil, because it will want to treat the powdered snow as if it was a solid block that it wants to land on. And so it can be a bit difficult to get the falling block entity inside of the powdered snow. However, with enough trial and error, I did manage to stumble across an alignment that is able to get the anvil into position. So that is the physics of our payload entity. But how do we actually get it to the desired coordinates? Well, this is where we need a bit of maths to help us translate the target coordinates into a quantity of TNT needed to hit those coordinates. And trust me, this is going to be amazing. There are heaps of resources that you can find for performing ballistic calculations with TNT, and I cover all of this in my video introducing the smart artillery. But it turns out that with the orbital strike cannons, things are much easier than you might think. So much so that the calculations can be done with a simple Excel spreadsheet. Instead of doing complex ballistic calculations, all I did was simply build the cannon and fire it in each direction. So all I'd need to do is punch in a setting such as 4 in one of the directions and then I would have this command block set up to log the position of the payload. I'll then fire the cannon, tick warp it running. So here is the console for my single player world where the logger has printed out the coordinates of our TNT. So we can see the coordinates where the TNT starts inside of the orbital strike cannon. And then we can also see the final coordinates of our payload right here. If we take a closer look at the various alignments for our payload and the TNT that propels it, in a perfect world everything will be aligned and we would obtain linear acceleration from all four sides. In reality, this is not the case, and instead we have these tiny offsets to the alignments which slightly skews the acceleration axis for each direction. 
You can see in this diagram, the red represents the lazy chunks and the green represents the entity processing chunks. For our payload to remain in stasis, its center must be slightly inside of the lazy chunks. Whilst for the propellant to explode, it must be positioned slightly inside of the entity processing chunks making this skewed acceleration an inevitable consequence of enabling omnidirectional fire control. Now, consider your Minecraft world and all of the coordinates of all of the blocks in that world. We are going to fix a coordinate system to our cannon, which only cares about the X and Z directions. You can imagine any point you want to hit with the cannon being some arbitrary point in this coordinate system. What we want is some function that transforms the vector from our cannon to the target into a vector in a new coordinate system whose axes are the settings of the cannon in each direction. As I demonstrated before, we can quite simply punch in some cannon setting and obtain a final position for that setting. And because the final position scales linearly with the amount of TNT, all we need is a matrix to fully describe the transformation. We then solve for this matrix in each quadrant around the cannon, because the tiny offsets in our alignments will translate into our transformation matrix for each direction. And you can actually see these transformation matrices in the Excel spreadsheet right here. So here we have the positive x, positive z direction, the negative x, positive z direction, the negative x, negative z direction, and then the positive x, negative z direction. These numbers in the diagonal cells are scalars for the amount of TNT needed to get a single block of displacement in the x and z direction respectively. Notice how these scalars go from positive to negative when we reverse the direction of an axis. This is because we can't have a negative amount of TNT, and so we have to transform the negative coordinate into a positive amount of TNT. These other two diagonals represent the amount that each axis will affect each other due to our slight offsets in the alignments of our TNT. This means that any TNT added to the positive x direction will also influence the z direction and vice versa. And so by taking all of these effects into account we can obtain block precision targeting for any position in a Minecraft world. So now we obtain a function that can convert any position in a Minecraft world into the amount of TNT needed to reach that position. The next step is to actually tell the cannon how much TNT is needed in each axis. Our source of TNT is these variable lineal dupers based off of a design by Intricate. When activated, they will simply dupe a whole bunch of TNT and then compress it into the cannon. These lecterns provide the interface where we add quantities of TNT to our duper arrays. The duper arrays can deliver a payload of anything from a single TNT all the way up to 111 TNT in a single batch. So let's say that we obtain a setting needing exactly 1000 TNT. Well, 1000 divided by 111 gives us at least 9 fully loaded batches from our TNT compressor. And so, back at our cannon, we take 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 items out of here and stick them into this dropper. However, what about all of this stuff that gets left behind once we do 9 fully loaded batches. Well, we'll go ahead and add one extra batch, like so. We then take the remainder, multiply it by 111, and what we get is the last batch containing exactly one TNT. So, going back to the settings for our cannon, we want to go to these lecterns, and make sure that the fine adjustment is set to exactly 1 and then the coarse adjustment is set to 0. We have now programmed the TNT compressor to deliver 9 batches fully loaded with 111 TNT and then one final batch containing exactly 1 TNT. Running the cannon we get 
That's one batch. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine fully loaded batches. Then one single batch containing one last TNT. And we have now programmed the acceleration of exactly 1000 TNT blasts into our payload. So now we have all the knowledge we need to deliver the payload to the target coordinates. But what about the pointy end of the stick? How do we actually weaponize the payload to make these devastating stab charges? Well, it all has to do with entity ticking priority. A secondary TNT compressor prepares the stab charge by throwing TNT together. But a massive stack of TNT on its own will simply fly above the target and explode in the sky. Not what we want. The key to making the payload stab holes in the ground is to carefully control the fuse time and the ticking priority of the TNT. So you can clearly see with these two command blocks I am actually able to create our stab charge. So what exactly is happening here? If we take a look inside of the command blocks, we can see this one is spawning 100 TNT with a fuse time of 6. This command block underneath is spawning also 100 TNT in the exact same location, except this time the fuse time is 5. So what we have here is two distinct batches of TNT with one game to confuse time difference between them. It's also extremely important which order these batches are spawned into the world. If I hit this button underneath, the stab charge does not work. However, if I press this button, the stab charge works perfectly. So we need a batch of TNT that is spawned first that has a longer fuse time than another batch of TNT which is spawned second with a shorter fuse time. Something to always keep in mind about TNT is that if it is ready to explode with a fuse time of zero, the TNT will always move first and then explode. So we create two batches of TNT. The first batch is given a fuse time of one and the second batch a fuse time of zero. The batches are then merged and fired by the cannon. At the target location, the payload now has no momentum, however the TNT will start moving due to gravity. The first batch to move has the longer fuse time, and so starts falling and ticks down to zero. The remaining batches have a fuse time of zero, so they also start falling, but once they are done moving, they explode. Note that the center of a TNT's explosion is actually slightly higher than the feet position of the TNT entity. So even if multiple TNT are in exactly the same location, the explosion of shorter fuse TNT will accelerate longer fuse TNT downwards. This is what enables our stab charge to punch into the ground at high speed. But wait a minute. How could you possibly have TNT that's created first have a longer fuse time than TNT created after it? After all, the way you actually control the fuse time is by simply letting the TNT tick down its fuse time. Well, this is where the lazy chunks come in pretty damn handy. So the TNT sits right here on this slab just inside of entity processing chunks where it ticks down its fuse time before being pushed over this chunk border into lazy chunks. The wiring is set up so that for the batch that comes in first, we actually push it into lazy chunks a single game tick earlier and then flip over this switch like so. And then this adds a single game tick of delay so the TNT ticks down an extra tick of fuse time before being pushed over into the lazy chunks. This switch is what allows us to have the batch of TNT that's created first have a longer fuse time than the batches of TNT that come after it. And if you wanted to make the stab charge more powerful and get a deeper penetration, 
All you really need to do is simply add a monostable here so that now we get one, two payloads with the longer fuse time before it flips the switch over. And then you can come up to here and in this dropper counter, you can increase these items to add additional stab charges to accelerate it downwards. In the showcase video, I also demonstrated how you can get the coordinates that a player logs at it and leave a stab charge above that location in unloaded chunks. Well, one problem with this is that the player gets a few moments of invulnerability when they first log in. The simple way to mitigate this invulnerability is to simply have the payload wait for longer before it detonates. And the way to achieve this is by reducing the delay between the TNT compressor and the piston that pushes the batches over into the lazy chunks. So all you need to do is just replace some of these delays with shorter ones. And now the batches should be pushed over sooner and have a longer fuse time. All right, that is just about everything regarding the orbital strike cannon that I wanted to cover. For those of you who stuck around to the end of the video, I have a special treat. A secret trick that I discovered while experimenting with lazy acceleration. Right here, I have a tunnel which goes outside of my render distance. Here we have two command blocks. This one right here will summon about a thousand TNT in this location right here, while this one will summon about 10 TNT right in front. What happens when I press this button will absolutely blow your minds. So here we just have a simple TNT cannon. And we are logging the locations where the TNT explodes. And would you look at that? Here we have the propellant charges where they end. But look, our payload actually detonated thousands of blocks away. The location where those TNT exploded is completely outside my render distance and not loaded whatsoever. However, the TNT was still able to explode there. Let's actually go ahead and teleport right to where the first TNT exploded. Of course, right now I still have protection enabled preventing the TNT from damaging blocks. All the way back at our ghetto cannon, I have placed down an alt account to keep the area loaded and I've also added this command block to instantly tick freeze when we spawn in the TNT. Here we go, the TNT is spawned in. Let's now teleport to the final location, like so. And let's go ahead and disable the carpet rule explosion no block damage by going to spectator we can sort of still see the chunks in this area. However, because I'm in spectator and spectators generate chunks is false, this area is technically not loaded. Let's go ahead and unfreeze. Oh my, what on earth just happened? This entire area is not being loaded. But would you look at that? TNT managed to explode right here. And look, another TNT exploded right here on the edge of a chunk border. And then another TNT on this chunk border. And so on. It turns out that TNT moving into unloaded chunks and then exploding immediately after that motion is complete will load that chunk for a single tick and allow the TNT to damage the blocks. And when you have a multiple TNT doing it in the same game tick, because the first TNT loads this chunk in front, the next TNT will be able to see the blocks in that chunk and then collide with them, meaning the next TNT explodes in the chunk behind it, and then we get a cascade of chunks loading and TNT colliding with each chunk. What's even more insane is that the chunk loading state that the TNT puts the chunk into doesn't even load the item entities. And so the TNT is able to blow up the blocks in the unloaded chunk without actually damaging any of the item entities. 
This introduces the tantalizing idea of the instant perimeter. And not even just an instant perimeter, but also technically an instant quarry. Because you could excavate an entire area without even loading it, and then collect all the items. Although I'd imagine if you did it to a really large area, you would have a lot of items and that would probably create a lot of lag. Alright, that is enough insanity today. It feels like it's taken five times the effort trying to break down this contraption and explain it than it did to simply put it together and show it off. So if you appreciate me taking the time and effort to do this, be sure to subscribe and let me know what crazy ideas you have for the concepts shared here. Thank you all very much for watching and I will see you next time.